I know in this video we are going to talk about the uh, pulmonary system. We are going to discuss the theory as well as the MCQ. So let's start. First, we are going to discuss the physiology of this system, all the important points which are related to the lung physiology. So the most important topic for the respiratory physiology is the lung volumes and the lung capacities. So there are four important lung volumes and four important lung capacities which are repeatedly asked in the MCQs. So first of all we are going to talk about lung volumes. So you can see the graph there is a tidal volume and then there is an inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. So let's recall few definitions. So the tidal volume is the volume inspired or expired with each normal breath. The inspiratory reserve volume is the volume that can be inspired over and above the tidal volume. Similarly, the expiratory reserve volume is a volume that can be expired after the expiration of a tidal volume. Whereas the residual volume is a volume that remains in the lungs after a maximal expiration. That is a volume that remains in the lung after maximal expiration and this volume cannot be measured with the spirometry. Now let's talk about lung capacities. So there is an inspiratory capacity, the functional residual capacity, vital capacity and the total lung capacity. So the inspiratory capacity as you can see in the graph is the sum of the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. Then we are going to see the uh, the total amount of air that can be drawn into the lungs after normal expiration. So after normal expiration, the total air that can be drawn into the lung, that is the sum of the tidal volume and the inspiratory capacity. The functional residual capacity is the expiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume that is the functional residual capacity it is a volume that remain in the lung after a tidal volume is expired so residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume that is the uh, that is the volume that remain in the lungs that after a tidal volume is expired that is a functional residual capacity the vital capacity is also known as the forced vital capacity the this is basically the sum of the tidal volume the inspiratory reserve volume and the expiratory reserve volume and is a volume of the air that can be forcefully expired after a maximum Inspiration. This is the volume of the air that can be expired after a maximal inspiration. So uh, the residual volume is not included in the functional residual capacity. The total lung capacity is basically the sum of all four lung volume and that is the volume of the lungs or volume in the lungs after a maximum inspiration. This is one of the key concepts which you must know about the respiratory physiology, the lung volumes and the lung capacities. The next topic for respiratory physiology is the dead space. So the dead space is uh, anatomical and the another dead space is the physiological. Now, physical, the anatomical dead space is that is present due to the volume of conducting airways and that is 150 ml that the physiological dead space is the functional volume that does not participate does not participate in the gaseous exchange and it may be almost equal to anatomical uh, in the normal conditions it's equal to the anatomical dead space the physiological dead space but in certain diseases it may increase or decrease and this increase and decrease topic is important for your exam which you must know in which cases the dead space increases and the dead space decreases and we are talking about the physiological dead space. It's important for you to remember that the pattern of breathing has no effect on dead space. But if the question is asked, dead space does not change in so you are going to answer the shallow breathing. So that has no effect. The breathing pattern has no effect on the dead space. So the answer is going to be the shallow breathing. So first recall the diseases in which the dead space increased. 
and the mnemonic to remember is hands on bed. H stand for hypotension and E for emphysema. N is for neck extension. S is for standing. And S is also for smoking. Let's recall H is for hypotension, E is for emphysema, N is for neck extension, and S is for standing and smoking. And hence on bed, B is for bronchoconstriction, E is for ETT to, to intubation, and D is for diseases such as pneumonia, ARDS, bronchitis, asthma, cardiac failure, and pulmonary embolism. So in all these conditions, the dead space is going to be increased. Whereas the dead space is going to decrease and the mnemonic to remember the condition is BATS NHS. BAT, B is for bronchodilation, A is for atelectasis, T is for tracheostomy, S is for sleep and NHS is for neck flexion is going to decrease the dead space and then we have hyperventilation and supine position. All these conditions are going to decrease dead space and this is all. Another important topic for respiratory physiology is surfactant. So surfactant is the one that lines the alveoli and keep alveoli dry. It is going to decrease the surface tension and going to increase the lung compliance. That means the lung becomes easier to fill. Moreover, it is synthesized by type 2 alveolar cell and consists primarily of dipalmatoyl phosphatidylcholine. In the fetus, surfactant may be present as early as gestational week 24. In the fetus, surfactant will be present as early as gestational week 24 and is almost always present at gestational week 35. The ratio of lecithin and sphingomyelin is 2 is to 1 in amniotic fluid reflects mature level of surfactant. Neonatal respiratory distress syndrome is due to the lack of surfactant and this lack of surfactant is going to cause the increased surface tension and decrease compliance of the lungs so that it has become difficult to inflate the lungs. So the ventilation, uh, so there is going to be a ventilation perfusion defect. The ventilation uh, is going to decrease and the lung fields will give a ground glass appearance. So these were the important points related to surfactant. Let's talk about oxygen transport and the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. So it's a very important point because multiple MCQs are from this topic. So what you need to know is that what shifts the curve towards the right side and towards the left side. The mnemonic is the things that shift the curve to the left side can be remembered by L. And when the curve is shifted towards the left side, then there is lower oxygen delivery. That means the affinity of the oxygen with the hemoglobin is increased, so there is less delivery to tissues. For instance, low hydrogen ion, low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, low 2,3 dpg, low temperature, and fetal hemoglobin, carbon monoxide poisoning. So all these things, they start from the L. And there are a few important things that you need to remember about 2,3 dpg that is present in RBC and enhance the ability of RBC to release oxygen near tissues that need it the most. It interacts with beta chain of hemoglobin so it is going to decrease the affinity for oxygen and promote the release of oxygen. So it is going to lower the oxygen delivery. Right, all these things, sorry, the low to a DPG is going to cause lower oxygen delivery, whereas the high to 3 DPG is going to increase the oxygen delivery. As fetal hemoglobin has no beta chain, so the affinity for oxygen is going to increase. The oxygen affinity for fetus is higher than that of the adult. The result in movement of oxygen from mother to fetus. About few uh, important about he fetal hemoglobin, there are a few important things that it is made up of the two alpha chain and two gamma chains. So that is why it has increased oxygen affinity and so it has lower oxygen delivery. About carbon monoxide, the affinity of hemoglobin for carbon monoxide is 200 times its affinity for oxygen. And when carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin, the affinity or craving of remaining side increased for oxygen. So that caused an extreme shift of the curve towards the left side. Another important thing is 
that we need to remember is the when the curve is shifted towards the right side r is for right and r is for raised oxygen delivery and the thing that need to be remembered raised hydrogen ion raised partial pressure of carbon dioxide raised 2 3 dpg raised temperature during exercise for example there is increase in temperature the tissue produces more carbon dioxide and this is going to decrease the tissue ph because carbon dioxide is acidic in nature so uh, when temperature is increased the tissue is going to produce more carbon dioxide and the acidity is going to decrease and through the bohr effect it is going to stimulate the oxygen delivery to the exercising muscle so one more important thing that you need to remember about the oxygen dissociation curve is that left shift of the oxygen dissociation curve due to low partial carbon dioxide is known as the haldane effect right haldane the l in the haldane left shift as low carbon dioxide is going to cause the left shift of the curve whereas bohr effect is going to shift the curve towards the right side and bohr effect is the effect or that is the exercise effect or that is the raised carbon dioxide effect r in bohr means right shift another thing that you need to remember is that the partial the p50 uh, is the oxygen tension at which hemoglobin is 50 percent saturated and the value for p50 is normal p50 is 26.7 uh, hemoglobin affinity is inversely related to its p50 value that is the meaning if the curve is shift towards the left side that means it has high affinity for oxygen and if the uh, it's shift towards the right side then it has a low oxygen affinity and therefore when the curve is shifted towards the left side the p50 is going to be low and if it's going to be towards the right side then the p50 is going to be high as the hemoglobin affinity is inversely related to p50 Another important thing that you need to remember in right shift of the oxygen dissociation curve, the most likely value of P50 would be, so if the curve is shifted towards the right side, P50 is going to increase from 26.7 to 35. And there is one more thing, during transport of carbon dioxide in the blood, the amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the plasma at 45 is 2.7%. This is a random fact that you need to remember. One important thing that you need to remember about the pulmonary vasculature is that, that in response to the hypoxia in all organs, uh, there is vasodilation. That is going to increase the oxygen delivery to the organs, but it's opposite in the lungs. It causes vasoconstriction. So, if there is MCQ that asks that pulmonary vasoconstriction occur due to reduced systemic partial pressure of oxygen. Let's talk about another topic that is the hypoxia. So there are four types of hypoxia. Hypoxemia, hypoxia, anemia, anemic hypoxia, stagnant hypoxia and histotoxic hypoxia. The hypoxemia hypoxia, the oxygen pressure is low. That means the partial pressure of oxygen is low. Whenever there is a mention of the word low partial pressure of oxygen in the MCQ, then the answer is going to be hypoxemic hypoxia that occur in high altitude or when there is abnormal ventilation perfusion ratio it also occur in hyperventilation anemic hypoxia is amount of hemoglobin to carry oxygen is low that occur in blood loss anemia carbon monoxide poisoning stagnant hypoxia is of when the blood flow to the tissue is low and that occur in heart failure and shock Histotoxic hypoxia is when the tissue can't utilize oxygen and that occurs in, uh, in cyanide poisoning. Uh, histotoxic hypoxia is when the tissue can't utilize oxygen and this occurs in cyanide poisoning. So this was four types of hypoxia that you must know for your MCQs because they repeatedly ask in the MCQs. Remember that the potent stimulator for erythropoiesis is erythropoietin and the stimulator for erythropoietin is hypoxia. So when there is hypoxia, there is going to be increased erythropoietin synthesis that is going to increase erythrocytes and that is going to increase the oxygen delivery. You need to remember that in renal adenoma, there is increased amount of erythropoietin and in the end stage renal disease, the anemia is due to decreased level of erythropoietin. 
Remember, erythropoietin is secreted by the kidney in response to cellular hypoxia. It stimulates RBC's production in the bone marrow. So it is released by the kidney and it stimulates uh, the red blood cells in the bone marrow. Erythropoietin is produced by interstitial fibroblast in the kidney in close association with the peritubular capillary and proximal convoluted tubule. So erythropoietin is produced by the interstitial fibroblast in the kidney. The particular interstitial fibroblast they are going to um, release the erythropoietin and this erythropoietin is going to act on the RBC which are present in the bone marrow. We are going to talk about the ventilation per fusion ratio. So there are two zones that is zone 1 and zone 3. Zone 1 is the lung apex and zone 3 is the base of the lungs. Zone 1 which is the apex, the ventilation and the blood flow is lowest at the apex. The ventilation and the blood flow. So, but the blood flow is more less than the ventilation. So, when there is decrease ventilation and more decrease in blood flow, this ratio is going to increase. So, there is increased ventilation perfusion ratio at the apex and it's opposite in the um, base of the lungs. The ventilation, the blood flow is higher and blood flow is more high than the ventilation so this ratio is going to decrease the ventilation perfusion is low at the base so as a result the partial pressure of oxygen is high at the apex because ventilation perfusion ratio is high and partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low at the apex whereas it is the opposite in zone 3 the partial pressure of oxygen is low and partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high at the base. And so let's see what happened to this ratio, the ventilation perfusion ratio and airway obstruction. If airway is blocked, right, so the ventilation is going to be zero and the blood flow remains normal, right? So a V divided by Q is the ratio, right? So the upper value becomes zero and the blood flow is normal, the overall ratio is going to be zero. And near the obstruction, there is going to be shunting. And this process is known as shunting when the ventilation becomes zero. There is no gaseous exchange. The partial pressure of oxygen carbon dioxide of the pulmonary capillary blood will approach their values in mixed venous blood. And the ventilation perfusion ratio in pulmonary embolism, a blood flow is completely blocked. For example, by embolism occluding the pulmonary artery, then the blood flow is going to be zero. If ventilation is normal and the perfusion is zero, then this is going to, as the denominator is going to be zero, then this ratio is going to be shifted towards the infinity. And this is called dead space. Anything divided by zero is infinity, so there is going to be a dead space when, when, when the perfusion is zero, when there is a block in the blood supply. So there is no gaseous exchange of alveolar air and the carbon dioxide pressure and the oxygen pressure will approach their values in inspired air. Alright, so there is going to be a dead space and the values are going to be of that of the inspired air and uh, there is going to be the blockage in the blood flow. So when there is a blockage in the blood flow, the ventilation perfusion ratio is going to be infinite. Whereas if there is a blockage in the airway, then this ratio is going to be zero. That means shunting. So regarding pulmonary parameters, so what happened to them in pregnancy? So regarding pulmonary parameters, there are some physiological adaptations. That include that there is always increase in cardiac output and there is also an increase in heart rate. The cardiac output is increased due to increase in preload and decrease after load. And increased heart rate is because there is increased placenta and uterus perfusion. There is anemia in pregnancy because there is more increase in plasma than in RBCs. So there is dilutional anemia. There is also hypercoagulability seen in the pregnancy. Pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state due to decrease blood loss at delivery uh, in order to cause decreased blood loss at the time of delivery so another respiratory parameters include that the minute ventilation and the tidal volume is going to increase whereas the total lung capacity uh, the minute ventilation is going to be increased and tidal volume is also going to be increased where the total lung capacity is going to be slightly decreased along with carbon dioxide which is also going to be slightly decreased. So total lung capacity 
and carbon dioxide both of these things are going to be decreased whereas minute ventilation and the tidal volume these two things are going to be increased in the pregnancy